So um, I've started reading this amazing book by Richard Powers, um, and in his book he says, the, b the best arguments in the world won't change a person's mind. The only thing that can do that is a good story. I kind of agree with that, because I've, I've actually been, so I've been working on climate change since 2004, and since this entire time I've been talking to lots of different people, and it's really hard just to show data and show facts, like the, the, the slides that I started off with, uh, with my talk today, that usually doesn't change people's minds, especially if their minds are already made up. So I think stories are really important. Uh, Neil Gaiman actually gave a talk at The Long Now, and he basically says, all good stories change you. And I think that's really powerful. All good stories do change us, but sometimes we don't know how they changed us. And sometimes the change takes place like way, way, way into the future. So I'm trying to figure out how to deal with that. So people don't act in terms of how do you, so what type of action am I trying, am I trying to get at? We need a price on carbon. I think all of, all of us will agree with that. We really need a price on carbon right now. And so we need public support for a price on carbon, and Washington State is start, try, starting to do that. We need to change individual behavior as well that reflects our new transition pathway that we're trying to get to. And so a lot of my past work has looked at facts and feelings separately. I've sort of kept them separate, and I've been toggling between bo both of them, because looking at them together makes things really, really messy. So what I've looked at is how do people understand what is most effective for them to change in their own lives? So if I were to ask you today, what is the single most effective thing you can do to decrease your energy consumption? Would you know? Do you want to shout out some answers? Don't have kids. Don't have kids. <laughs> yes! Don't eat meat. Don't eat meat. Don't fly. Don't fly. Don't fly. Don't fly. Electric cars. Food waste. Food waste. All right, so we have a really good list. I'm going to show you what the modal response is in the United States. You're going to be really surprised. <laughs> <laughs> and then I've also been looking at how do you change social norms? How do you get people to pay attention to this problem? Because attention is actually a very limited resource. So think of attention as like a very small pond of water that you carry <laughs> with you everywhere you go. And every time someone asks for something, you're like giving them a little bit of that water. And then you're like, oh my god, where did my water go? I need to go back into my cave. Um, <laughs> So that's what uh, attention is. It's a, it's a serious, limited resource. So I asked you this question, in your opinion, what is the most effective thing? Here are the responses that we get. Since the 1980s, this has been the number one modal response that people, get, people give to this open-ended question. What is the single most effective thing? The modal response, of starting with Willett Kempton in the 1980s, has been turning off the lights. And this is when you ask people very broadly, hey, what is the single most effective thing? Very similar to what I asked you. However, a surprising finding from my work that I'm not gonna show you, but I'll talk to you about it for a second, is if you ask people, what is the single most effective thing other Americans can do? Do you know what the answers are? All of the ones that you told me. <laughs> so carpooling, getting an efficient car, getting an electric car, uh, biking instead of uh, driving. So the answers really change. So it's not that people don't know what is effective, it's that they don't want to do those behaviors themselves. Whoa, you're right. So I'm telling you, more challenges than solutions. Um, so turning off the lights is great, please do that, but it's not the most effective thing. Yeah, okay, you guys figured it, you guys know already. Um, so I also, you know, given my training in physics and in engineering, I was really interested in how do people quantitatively estimate how much energy different appliances use. So if I were to ask you, do you know what the difference is between a watt and a watt hour? Do you guys know? You guys know. Okay, two hands went up. <laughs> do you guys know? Yeah, three hands went up. <laughs> okay. All right, a, a, a couple of guys in the back, and there's a friend saying, yeah, he knows, but he, okay, they're all pointing at each other. I don't think they really know. <laughs> Um, so a lot of people do not know what a watt and a watt hour is, right? So they don't know what the units of energy are. So what I wanted to understand is if I were to ask people about different appliances in their homes, how well do they, can they understand how much energy different appliances use, just broadly? So what I first had to do, and over here on the y-axis you have perceived energy used or saved in watt hours, and on the x-axis you have actual energy used or saved in watt hours. And this is a log-log scale, so it goes from 1, 10, 100, so on and so forth. So data that lies along the diagonal line means people's perceptions match reality, okay? So what I said was, all right, imagine a 100-watt light bulb. A 100-watt light bulb being left on for an hour uses 100 units of energy. Now, how many units of energy would your dishwasher use? Would you guys be able to kind of... 
Yeah, in the same amount of time, in one hour. So that was like the type of question I asked people. I won't, I won't, I won't put you on the spot. I'll just show you the data. <laughs> um, so the, so I, I told everyone, all right, 100, uh, uh, 100 watt light bulb uses 100 units of energy. How many units of energy would these different appliances use? So in general, the orange line is the overall curve, but I'm gonna walk you through it with some examples. So a laptops are overestimated by a factor of two, so people think it's equivalent to one light bulb when it's actually equivalent to half. And this is data from 2009, so now laptops are becoming way, way, way more efficient. Um, changing the washer setting from hot to cold actually uh, is underestimated by a factor of 40. So people think changing from hot to cold is equivalent to saving one light bulb when it's actually equivalent to saving 40 light bulbs. Um, so this is the entire set of uh, appliances that we looked at. And so what you notice is that when you start using a lot of energy, when you start thinking about appliances that use a lot of energy, there's a huge underestimation. A lot of this data is below the diagonal line. Not just that, people are not able to uh, correctly differentiate between these appliances, so there's this compression bias. So what we really need to do if we are thinking about energy use is we need to take that curve and pull it up towards the diagonal. How do we make people accurate? Then there's the other question, which I hope you guys will ask me, is that does accuracy matter if we have limited effort? And I would say, yeah, it does. If people think that you know, some of these ineffective behaviors are really effective and they're not, that's really problematic. So what we, does anyone have accurate perceptions? So we asked, this is disclaimer two, <laughs> we asked two electrical engineers and they're really accurate. <laughs> so engineers, yeah. <laughs> We're awesome. <laughs> um, so engineers do really well on this task. Um, and so what we did was we tested a manufactured heuristic. So let me walk, let me break that down and what that means. A heuristic is basically a rule, right? So I can give you a rule to enact a particular behavior. A manufactured heuristic is a manufactured a rule that I give you to use when you're making a decision. So if I were to tell you large appliances that heat and cool use a lot more energy than you think, that actually is a heuristic that if you're making your energy estimates, that actually pulls that curve up towards the diagonal. So I'm not teaching you what the difference is between watts and watt hours. I'm not telling you how to compute how much energy different appliances use. I'm just giving you a very simple rule. What we, so that's what the heuristic condition is right here. So you can see the baseline basically replicates the original data. The heuristic condition bumps the slope up. And then if I give you multiple anchors, so I just gave one light bulb in the first condition, but if I were to give you like an LED and I, and I were to give you a dishwasher, that actually helps you gear shift between these different appliances. So that actually improves your perceptions a lot. So there are ways that we found that actually are able to correct people's misperceptions of energy use, sort of circumventing teaching people basic energy physics. You guys with me so far? Yeah? Okay, great.